Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, May 26th, 2022. I'm delighted to be back with Professor James L. Beck. Jim, it's great to be with you again. Thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to be back. Jim, today what we're going to do after our initial discussion where we took a terrific tour of all of your contributions, your approach to the research, today I'd like to go all the way back to New Zealand, learn about your family background. Let's start first with your parents, but perhaps even before them, how many generations back does your family go in New Zealand? Uh, on my mother's side, um, we go back to, let's see, my great-great-grandfather came from England. Um, on my father's side, um, my, f my, uh, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was adopted. Um, so, and we've not been able to uh, go beyond that. This was like, you know, 1880 or something. Um, but he came from a Scottish area in New Zealand, so an area settled by the Scots down the South Island. So very likely, you know, has Scottish blood. Yeah. Tell me about your parents. Where did they grow up? Uh, both, both of them uh, grew up in um, Tamaranui, which is where I was born. Um, my uh, my dad was born in 1919, so he grew he he grew up during the depression basically. Um, so uh, he had to leave. He's in a poor family, so he had to leave school at 12 to go working. So he never went to high school. Uh, my mother was born 10 years later, 1929, and she her father was like a farmhand out in the, the boonies. So um, there was a it's just a very small farming community. There was a two two classroom school, elementary school. So she stayed there to 14, did an extra year with a teacher, you know, um, but never went to high school. So neither of my parents went to high school. Um, you know, they did very well in life. They, they were smart, but they just never had the formal education, you know. And what were your parents' professions? Uh, so... My mother um, was a mother, housewife. Um, she did, uh, when I was young, work on a Friday evenings, which was a big thing in New Zealand because all the stores used to close during the weekend. And at Friday, they were open to 9 p.m. So you, well, I guess she used to walk, work all day Friday, but she or maybe she went at, at the midday, but she wouldn't come home till after 9 p.m. Um, uh, my dad... Uh, well, well, when he left school, he started as a painter, but he was allergic to something in the paints. And so in the end, he switched over to become a butcher apprentice, ultimately ended up managing the butcher shop in Tamaranui. And, um, uh, but I also should add that he went away as a young man uh, at the Second World War, um, December 1940, he went to North Africa and then to Greece and when Greece capitulated, uh, April 1941, my dad was captured and he spent the rest of the war as a prisoner of war in Austria. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. So Did he, he ever talk off. about his experiences? Did you ever get uh, to hear stories? It's interesting. And I think this is a common theme. He did not to me, but occasionally, you know, we would have a party at our place and I would hear him, you know, discussing some things from the war and I was hanging around listening. Um, when my two boys got older, teenagers, they got very curious and they asked him and he kind of opened up. So, you know, I heard some more about it. Um, but uh, so, uh, yeah, I heard some of his experiences. Uh, but, you know, he lost four years of the, the, the prime time of his life, right? He was, uh, uh, I think he was 20, let me see, 21. Oh, actually, that's right. On his way to the war, the boat pulled into Sydney and he had his birthday there at 21, yeah. So, um, yeah, and my mother grew up during the war years, of course, and out in the country and uh, um, kind of isolated, so... Uh, you know, it, uh, they both, they both, um, 
well, I wouldn't say they had a struggle. I, I think they enjoyed, you know, they didn't, I don't know what to say about that. Yeah. So um, my dad came back from the war and um, was working in the butcher shop and he used to deliver meat uh, and, and on a bicycle with a, with a, a basket in the front. Sometimes, you know, he's mostly working in this shop and he delivered to my grandparents and there was this attractive young girl who at that stage was only 16. Um, so he had his eye on her and when she turned 18, the father gave them permission to, to get married and, uh, and then they did. Yeah. And then I was born, um, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, 14 months after they got married. So my mother was only 19. So, And did you grow up where your parents were? Yes, until we were 15. So in May of 1964, my parents moved uh, to Auckland, basically to allow me to get a better education. Mm -hmm. There was nothing wrong with Taranui High School, but, it, you know, it... it uh, there were schools in Auckland that were kind of more highly ranked and challenging. They felt for me. How so far? Was, how I, far away I, is Auckland? Uh, One hundred and eighty-eight miles uh -huh. from from Tamanui. Um, yes, Tamanui is a very isolated town. At the time I was growing up, it was a population of six thousand, but it's in the middle of a rugged country, um, and. Uh, you know the, the the highways in and out you have to wind around and so on um anyway so we moved to auckland when i was 15 and a few months and you know i really thrived at, at the school i went to it was called mount albert grammar school uh, i was able to pick up the topic uh, the subjects pretty much that i was um, having a, 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 um, uh, learning at uh, Terminary High School, um, mostly, so I had English and French, but mostly science, you know, chemistry, physics, and, uh, well, I, di I didn't, I dropped biology to my pleasure <laughs> at that time. It wasn't very interesting because I had biology back at Terminary High School. But the interesting thing was they had a, a class called Electricity and Magnetism, which you think, well, that's part of physics. But there was a, a national exam called the National School Certificate, which had that as a subject. And I loved it. And so I took this class. I had to catch up like, uh, well, the academic year starts in February there and finishes December. So I was up there and in May, I think. So I, I was like three months into the term. Or, or, yeah. So I had to catch up. I had the textbook and everything. Um, and uh, loved that subject and got 96% in the, in the National School Certificate exam in that subject. Uh, and I'll just, before I throw up, give it back to you, just note that I got contacted from some class, a classmate and he'd, he'd put a group together about 10 so far, um, that they're having their 100th year celebration, the school. And it's going to be in September. And he's sort of reaching out. He's finding people's, you know, on, on the internet and so on. So, you know, for, it was kind of appropriate because it's right ha happening right now while we're, you know, we're doing this, uh, these interviews. Um, I might go back. We'll see, see what happens. Um, I did very well at that school, um, so you know it's. Uh, I owe it a lot. Uh, I might go back just to see these guys. Anyway, I, I'll throw it back to you. Now, yeah. when you when you moved when the family moved to to Auckland, did you move to the suburbs? Were you in the city proper? No, in the suburbs. What happened is, my dad, a war buddy that came from the same area in, in New Zealand and was with him uh, when he was captured in the prison war camp. Um, he had a butcher shop in, in a suburb of Auckland called New Lynn, and he wanted to, he had to um, get out of it. And so my dad uh, swapped our house in Taramanui for his butcher shop, basically. 
And, and the reason this, this uh, buddy of dad's had to uh, leave Auckland was that his family owned a farm and it was run by his two brothers and his two brothers had a car accident and got killed. So he was the only one left to um, run the show, you know, so he had to go back. So that's how my father ended up with the butcher shop in, in Auckland. Yeah. Jim, moving to Auckland, either in your neighborhood or in the school, was there any diversity? Were there any people from, you know, from, from heritage, from Africa, from Asia, indigenous people? Did you see anybody who didn't look like you? Um, yes, there were um, a sprinkling of, uh, of Asians in the class. Uh, but, oh, by the way, I should say it was only males. It's uh -huh. since gone co-ed. Uh -huh. for, for the first, I don't know, 75 years, it was just males. Um, and um, I don't think that we had any Maoris in the class, different in Tamaranui, because it was a heavily... I, I should add that in Tamaranui, the European settlers only got there in early 20th century. Uh -huh. It was basically... a it's, called, it's in called the King Province. It was a Maori king. It was a heavily Maori area. So um, we did have the, at, at Tamarini High School a number of Maoris, um, you know, um, but but uh, not in the in at Mount Albert Grammar in my my class because I was up in the they ranked you they you know and you put in and I was up in the the top academic class, you know, focused on going to university. Um, in fact, focused on making a good reputation for the university because the university kind of um, cultivated uh, us to take a national exam and hopefully do very well. So the school gets, you know, high rankings, uh, which we did, which I did. So uh, there were certainly Maori boys on campus. I see, in fact, I, I had a couple in the rugby team. I played rugby. Uh, it, not the, not for the school uh, top team, but uh, the lower down team. Um, so there were Maori boys there, uh, and uh, don't think there's any Asians playing rugby with me. But uh, uh, Jim, growing up, did you always yeah. gravitate towards science? Were you interested in nature and exploring and taking things apart? Yes, I was very much. My whole life was. What's behind it? You know, what I'd want, I wanted to penetrate down either when I was young by pulling everything apart or later, you know, getting into what's the theoretical basis, like we've talked about the probability. Um, but science, well, math was the dominant thing, but certainly, you know, science, physics, and to some extent, chemistry. Um, I remember that my parents got me, and I think it came weekly, it came out of Great Britain. Um, understanding science. It was this very colorful magazine, uh, you know, illustrating different topics in science and engineering, like, for example, how an uh, internal combustion engine works or uh, how a radio works and uh, how about, you know, galaxies and all this sort of stuff. So I used to read them with interest, you know, and I, I, I it, went, it went for a couple of years. I, I actually still had them and i think they're stored somewhere you know i've got probably a hundred of them or something um science has moved on that was many years ago but still a lot of the stuff is so basic i think it would still be of interest to you know to people to young people yeah. jim what about the space race being so isolated in new zealand were you following that the soviet american rivalry oh yes um you know when the sputnik went up in 57 uh, I was, uh, you know, fascinated by it. I remember laying on my, on out on the lawn at my grandmother's place, who she had a house up on a hill, look tracking it at night, watching the satellite uh, go go over. I don't know if that was a Sputnik. Now, I can't remember if the trajectory covered New Zealand, but certainly uh, maybe it was the US put up one that had a trajectory that went over New Zealand. You know, um, so. Yes, I, I was, of course, interested in the space race. Um, I was 20 years old when I put the man on the moon, which, you know, was a uh, very a great event. Um, didn't have television myself, but uh, watched it on somebody else's television. Yeah. When did your family get a television set? Um, 
We didn't have it in Tamanui because it was too isolated. They ultimately put in some repeater station, but after I'd gone. Um, so, and we didn't have it when I first moved to Auckland. So I think it, um, we, we rented a place for a, a year or two, then my parents bought a, a house. And I think it was at that stage that we got the television. So I was probably 17, maybe when I, uh, oh, and, but I should add that my auntie uh, who lived in Auckland um, had a television very early and I used to go visit and stay at my auntie's and, you know, she would quietly let me stay up late so I could see, you know, um, Bonanza and, and <laughs> these sorts of, you know, uh, uh, there was that spooky one of uh, something about the night and all that. So. I did get to see TV before that, but it was not news or anything, you know, I was watching. Yeah. Jim, was it when, when it was time to start thinking about college, was yeah. leaving New Zealand an option? Was that even conceivable at that point? No, not for bachelors, because, you know, it'd be way too expensive. Um, the So uh, at that time, New Zealand educa university educations were almost free. I think we paid $50.00 a term per um per subject or something you know it was it was nominal of course fifty dollars was a lot more then but uh i never ever thought of that and i don't know anybody who went overseas for undergraduate degree um but quite common at the graduate level you know um so you know i obviously i mean university of auckland is the biggest and generally speaking, the most highly ranked, although some other universities in different areas are more highly ranked. But obviously, obviously, that was the best one to go to because it was right in the same city. And I used to um, bought myself a car for my first year at university, an old car. And I used to go, for, I, used to, I lived at home, gave my parents some nominal rent to help them out. And because uh, I was getting scholarships, I won scholarships. So I was getting some income. Yeah. Now, is, is university in New Zealand, is it modeled after the British system where you declare a major right away? Yes, definitely. And you don't have to do humanities and social science like at Caltech, you know, which is, <laughs> was good for me because I thrive more on the technical subjects. Um, so I went straight into a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Physics. I took Physics for the first couple of years. But really, um, my major was viewed as mathematics. Although you didn't really declare the major. You declared you were doing a Bachelor of Science and then you took what you wanted to do with mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Did you ever so, think about theory? Did you ever pursue that path at all or was it always more on the experimentation side? Oh, no, definitely theory. No, I was a mathematician. So, um, you know, uh, I did some, well, we, we had, you know, experimental uh, class labs and things like that in, in physics, nothing in mathematics. Um, so, no, I was basically a theoretician, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess I, I had an aptitude for math and I loved it, you know. So was it a dual major then? Did you have both a math and a physics degree? You could say that, yes. It doesn't, I mean, it just says a Bachelor of Science. It doesn't say Bachelor of Science and Math. I think I, in my CV, I put Math because I thought, well, I only took a couple of, I think I took um, Physics, no, maybe I took three classes. There were, you know, Physics one, two, three, which is like first, second, third year, but that was it, you know. So, um, yeah, but you could view it as like a double major, yeah. Jim, being in college in the late 1960s in New Zealand, was there any political protest of any kind that you'd see in the United States and in Europe? Oh, yes. I mean, the only time I've ever uh, marched in a political pro protest was at that time because of the Vietnam War. So, you know, I was at the age where if I'd been in America, I'd be being called up. Right. But um, uh, New Zealand had a... Uh, uh, a, a professional army and volunteers, you know, so they never did a call up, but they had a token contingent there just because the US, Australia and, and um, New Zealand had this, you know, pact to defend, defend each other. If, if America got 
attacked, New Zealand would come to help. <laughs> uh, so, but um, so they they did send a, a, a rather small contingent. I mean, it wasn't the size of a battalion or anything. Uh, but we we did uh, you know most uh, people in the university did not approve of New Zealand's participation in Vietnam and what because of what was happening and so there were lots of protests and speech on campus and then they organized a march up the main street of Auckland Queen Street and you know I participated and that's the only time I've ever politically protested you know I felt strongly about it and of course I was young and um, and you know it was very relevant because my my peers at least in America my age group was being killed you know for a war that didn't um, didn't seem uh, just at the time to me um, so that's it I mean I that you know I used to go there, there was a a uh, a student who was a year older than me that loved to get up on the on the soapbox in the square at the university and talk about you know and protest and so on and he uh, he wrote a book uh, when he was about 21 called bullshit and jelly beans and uh, <laughs> I loved it and um, uh, he ended up being mayor of a um, of, of a big city in New Zealand or two cities actually one right down the south island so he uh, he uh, uh, is that phone coming through annoying you that's okay uh, I, should yes. it. I don't know um, anyway uh yes so but mostly i kept my head down because i was just busy working enjoyed what i was doing in my work you know and of course i had friends that, that i did things with so now I just to really foreshadow to graduate school did you do any engineering work as an undergraduate no no so that was an interesting um that was an issue when i it was, I'm sort of jumping ahead, but I got interested in earthquake engineering and people said, oh, go to Caltech. It's, the, it's yeah. you know, the world leader in earthquake engineering. And I remember going to talk to a professor and I said, you know, I'm a bit worried because I have no engineering background. He says, don't worry. He says, it's more important to have a math background yeah. if you're <laughs> an engineer at Caltech. And I think he was right, you know, because I, I picked up a lot of the, the, the uh, engineering um, in my in my I had to take uh, classes of course in the first year as a graduate student at Caltech and I took earthquake engineering and structural mechanics and things like that yeah so now what was the source of your interest in in earthquakes did does New Zealand have earthquakes did you experiencing them growing up I did but yes um it's earthquake uh, it's it's seismic seismically active um uh, country. It's on the edge of the Pacific plate. In fact, the boundary between the Indian Australian plate, which is, you know, a huge plate, um, tectonic plate is New Zealand's the boundary between that and the Pacific plate. And as you know, uh, San Andreas fault is a boundary of the Pacific plate and the North American plate. So you sort of go diagonally across this huge tectonic plate, the Pacific one, and you end up uh, at a subduction zone uh, off the east coast of New Zealand. And New Zealand's being racked around a bit because the South Island, the uh, Indian Australian plate is being subducted under the Pacific plate. Whereas on the north, that's on the west, on the east and the North Island, it's the other way around. And you, so it's kind of New Zealand's got a big transform fault like the San Andreas. It's an alpine fault because it's pushed up the southern Alps. Yeah. So it's 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 a lot of the earthquakes are, di are big and deep, mm -hmm. so they're not so destructive. But we do have you know shallow ones there too. Yeah. What was the physics that you liked the most as an undergraduate? Hmm. Well, I think um, the. I think basically electricity, magnetism, um, more than say the thermal side. Um, quantum mechanics was intriguing, 
you know, I had so good, good math. I knew all about Hilbert spaces and all that. So I could, the math and quantum mechanics wasn't the problem, but what did it all mean? And that was, it turned out, no one really knew. <laughs> so I wasn't the only one. And, you know, I like to dig at the basis down to the, the bottom and figure everything out. And I, I, I didn't really have the time because I was busy. And I, I revisited that, you know, th th like three decades later. Um, so I can't say at the time quantum mechanics, well, it intrigued me, but yeah, I mean, I was more traditional, I think, in, in, in these other subjects, other topics like, you know, uh, I guess gravity, there wasn't much to do with it, but you know, mechanics, I guess mechanics and, and electricity and magnetism, yeah. Jim, when you expressed this interest in earthquake engineering, did you know yourself about the Seismo Lab in Caltech or one of your professors alerted you? Uh, one of my professors. I took a class in, in the engineering school called Engineering Science, so it was quite mathematical. And I got um, to know a, the head of the department, um, Professor Cecil Segerden. So he was a resource um, that I went to uh, after I'd started working for the New Zealand government to sort of figure out where to go um, for, my, for my graduate studies. And actually at the time, so he worked in fluid mechanics, but actually at the time I had two paths I could go, either fluid mechanics, and he suggested going to England, Cambridge. There was a famous group of Professor George Batchelor or uh, earthquake engineering. I was kind of, which way shall I go? Because I was doing research in both areas at, at the lab I was in. And he recommended going to Caltech to do the, if I'm going to do the earthquake engineering. Um, and he mentioned a couple of guys that had gone through this gone through caltech one in, in engineering science another from civil engineering at the university of auckland so i i actually visited them and talked to them about about it you know uh, just to get a, a handle on it now but you, until that time i hadn't heard of caltech now you stayed on for the masters at auckland uh yes so i went straight on for that and then after the year of that, you know, which I had to do six classes, very intensive, pure and applied math. Um, I had had enough of, you know, just learning passive, passively. And so I put off with my PhD and went and worked for the New Zealand government in the research lab. What was the work? What kind of lab work was it? Uh, well, I should back up a little bit and say that the first summer, uh, that I was at university, so that's, you remember in New Zealand, that's uh, 67, 68. You know, we finish in December and go back in February at the university. That summer I went and worked in Wellington for this physics and engineering lab of the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. That was a government department, department that doesn't exist anymore, headed by the Minister of Science. And so I, got a taste of the research there and liked it. I actually worked in the optics section. That and then when I went back the following summer, I um, worked in the uh, heat transfer section. They were interested in the geothermal areas and power production and how long the, the fields could be maintained, how much could be pumped out and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I stayed there the following summer. So I did three summers and got a couple of papers, one from the apply, from the optics and one from the um, working in the uh, heat transfer section. And um, then when I started at, at, the, at the PL, uh, I went back to the heat transfer section. And so I started working in, in that area for a couple of years and got involved in a couple of different areas um, just because of my math background, people come to me, you know, I'm the young guy sort of with all the math and so on. And so, um, they'd say, I'm working on this intriguing problem and, you know, would you be interested in looking at it and so on. And so I got involved in, uh, a couple of things. Um, one was anisotropic theory of growth stresses in trees, which was very intriguing. 
Um, when you cut the tree for timber, it releases these stresses and warps the timber, especially in hardwoods. And I looked in analysis of that, uh, you know, like elasticity theory. Um, and that should have been a paper, but I finished it just before I was leaving for in August 74 to go to graduate school at Caltech. So it only, it, it's, it's forever a uh, technical report of the lab and the lab no longer exists, but I put it under my website so people can get at it. Um, and then I got this other area of uh, engineering seismology section here came to see me. He said, we've got this really interesting, a really interesting proposed design by the chief engineer of the New Zealand railways. And they're not sure how to analyze it. They got this idea, they think it'll work, um, but it's completely novel. There's nothing like it in the world. And, you know, would you be interested in seeing it, analyzing its earthquake response? Uh, so it needed a dynamic model. We needed earthquake motions that have been recorded as input. And uh, so that got me interested in the, that side of things, you know. Now, and when you way, when you went to work for the government, did you always intend to go to graduate school, that this would be sort of a gap couple of years? I did. And the people at the lab, you know, the management, they, they pointed out that I would should apply for a National Research Council scholarship, fellowship, right, to go overseas anywhere. Um, it's very, it was very generous. It was competitive. And so that after working there a few years, um, I should go for it. And, you know, they would throw their weight behind it. And um, so this council, you know, picked people from across New Zealand each year. And I got, got the fellowship, which was very generous. And, and I was married by then. And I also had two little kids, so it was needed. Um, I actually won a Fulbright fellowship too, but the National Research Council wouldn't let you have both, you know, so the Fulbright really just paid my expenses to get to get to America. Then I would have to rely on getting a GRA or GTA or something. So clearly the National Research Council scholarship fellowship was the best option. You know. And by the way, it was very generous and it wasn't taxed by the US government or the New Zealand government. So the only time in my life I had no taxes to pay on my income, you know, so Jim, did you look anywhere? Did, did you look anywhere besides Caltech? I did. So the, for the earthquake engineering, I looked at a couple of other places. Um, one was, you know, I actually can't remember it, whether I did Stanford or Berkeley. And, um, I was focused on Caltech, but I do remember I one was Purdue, and Purdue sent my uh, acceptance by ordinary mail and in those days that took a month or something to get to new zealand instead of sending it by airmail you know you had to everything goes airmail now i think or you know so uh i'd already been accepted by caltech by the time the purdue acceptance came in um so i did apply for a few schools there uh and i didn't apply for the cambridge for the fluid mechanics because i decided that you know go the earthquake engineering route and i must say that part of that was california seemed a very desirable place compared with foggy wet england <laughs> so <laughs> that had some influence because uh, both of them i was interested intellectually in working in you know fluid mechanics and basically structural dynamics and the earthquake loads so um yeah that's sort of settled the deal and uh, off I went to Caltech. Jim, I'm curious. It's such a far way away, and you don't know what the future holds. But did you have a sense that when you left for Caltech, that you'd be moving to the United States, making a life for yourself here? No, not at all. Um, I planned to go back to New Zealand, work again for the the DSIR, and uh, you know just settle down. And it was, uh, you know, there were a lot of really good guys that uh, my my colleagues, uh, uh, you know, good. Uh, uh, good people and good technically so that was my and I was so I was happy there before I went to America and when I came back though um you know no internet in those days 18 hour flight from Los Angeles you just felt I felt isolated down there even though 
there was a community of researchers that just it was like I'd left the action, you know, and so I couldn't settle down. And so um, I let uh, my advisor, Paul Jennings, who later became provost at Caltech, I let him know that I'd be interested in coming back, not necessarily to Cal Caltech, because at that stage, they didn't have a position open, but, um, you know, which has we heard other op op uh, uh, other possibilities. And so it turned out that um, they did open a position at Caltech and I applied to it. And also UC Irvine, there was a New Zealander in the head of the department there. And when he knew from Paul, because Paul was a friend of his, uh, that he uh, that I was interested in coming back, uh, they also, I guess, had a position open, but he, he contacted me, phoned me and said, you know, apply for our position too. If you don't get to Caltech, you know, here's a possibility. We'd love to have you. So anyway, I came over and interviewed for both of those positions and got offers for both of them. Um, and thought that I said to my wife, you know, I think I'm going to have to choose between prestige and money because I knew UC Irvine that quickly offered me a pretty good salary for those days. And so, and I didn't think Caltech would match it, but I told them what I was getting, what that offered me, and they matched it. So I never had to uh, face that trade off. Jim, back in 1974, what were your impressions when you first arrived at Caltech? Uh, I, I found um, my classmates, I was impressed at how, um, how they could speak up and, uh, you know, they, they were much more, uh, generally had the feeling of, of that, that the, the students there, the Americans were, you know, confident in public speaking that, cause that, that was a big thing for me. I was as nervous as anything to do, to, to speak, do seminars and so on when I first were there. Um, and I attributed the, that to the different cultures in New Zealand, you know, uh, you know, basically in New Zealand, children were to be seen, but not, not heard, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> and, and whereas here, you know, uh, you had these uh, sessions where people got, got up and it's like a show and tell or something, you speak of ethics and they're encouraged to speak out in class and so on. Uh, I remember that sort of sticking out. Um, it, the, uh, you know, I could see that the quality of the class in there were, was exceptional. Uh, I liked that. I, 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 I kind of rose to the occasion. I, I thrived on that. Um, and I felt that it was much easier than in the New Zealand system at university because we had exams every quarter and you're only tested on that quarter subjects. Uh, and um, in New Zealand, you had exams at the end of the year. So you were tested on the whole year. You had to study for it. And so to me, it was a piece of cake, you know. I only had to study for this quarter. It was, you know, what, 10 weeks or something, you know. Um, so that was another thing. Um, but... Uh, now, your initial yeah, interest in earthquake engineering, what program did that lead you in? Were you at the Seismo Lab? Where were you? No, no, no. So Caltech had the um, earthquake engineering program. They had an earthquake engineering research lab. I think it normally still exists, but basically it's, there's only one, I think, person doing... Um, earthquake engineering now, um, Asamaki, um, Professor Asamaki, Dominiki, um, Dominiki. So, uh, but this was a very strong program and um, there was excellent technical reports being published by the EERL, it was called. So they cooperated with the Seismo Lab. We had this joint earthquake research affiliates program to raise money from industry. And that was basically George Hausner and um, over in Jolly, uh, Bob Sharp. I don't know if you know about him sure. at the time, contemporary of, of George's. Um, and they, they, so we used to have these annual earthquake research affiliates conferences where we'd get up and talk about our research and so on. So we cooperated with Seismo Lab, but 
you know, we were the engineering side and they were the seismology side. And there was a big difference in the data being utilized too, because they had seismographs, very sensitive instruments go off scale when it got uh, you know, interesting from the engineering point of view. And we had these accelerographs, which um, Caltech had, uh, particularly a guy, Professor Donald Hudson, had sort of cultivated or consulted with a company to build in, in uh, Pasadena. And uh, these accelerographs were distributed around um, in structures because of a bylaw that primarily was due to Professor George Hausner. He got the city council to say, you know, we need to understand how these high rise buildings react in earthquakes. And the way to do that is to put instruments in it that will record it when an earthquake comes. So they're not running all the time. They just trigger when, you know, got batteries in them, trigger when there's a, when there's an earthquake. And that bylaw was passed in sometime in, in the late sixties and in 71, the San Fernando earthquake occurred, I think it was February 9th, and um, something like 50 buildings had recorded motions. So all of a sudden, all this data was available uh, to tell us how buildings responded in earthquakes. So, and, and none of these, none of the instrument build, none of the instrumented buildings were badly damaged. So there was one, the Holiday Inn in Van Nuys, that, that suffered pretty seriously. Luckily, it didn't collapse. But the rest of them, it, it, um, it, you know, got them going, but it didn't really um, stress them, you know, uh, where, where we, we would be worried. Yeah. Jim, academically or administratively, was there, was there much cross-pollination with the Seismolab? Um, not a lot. Um, Paul Jen well, Paul Jennings and Hiro Kanamori, you know, both eminent in earthquake engineering seismology respectively cooperated on some re research that was was interesting that was sort of a common thing to uh, between them um so there was uh some joint activity going on but it wasn't until uh 1995 that we had this idea of um in fact we were approached by ed stolper who later became uh, provost um about the possibility of a joint appointment in the two. And that person that ended up filling that was Tom Heaton, who at that time worked for the USGS right. in Pasadena. So he was a joint appointment. In fact, his title was professor, maybe well, it's emeritus now, but anyway, I think still is professor of engineering and seismology. So it was the idea of putting engineering and seismology together, you know. Uh, so that led to more cooperation between the, uh, the two groups. But interestingly enough, if you look at Tom's students, graduate students, PhD, PhD students, they are dominantly, the large majority are actually civil engineers. Right. Yeah, so it's quite interesting, yeah. Jim, what was the process for you choosing a graduate advisor? Well, I was going there in earthquake engineering, right? And the two leading figures there were um, Hausner, who was about to retire, and Jennings. Jennings was had been a, a graduate student uh, supervised by George Hausner. So um, when I got there and talked to Professor Hausner, he suggested, you know, that I could work with... Uh, uh, Paul Jennings because Another he was not he was not taking graduate students at that stage. That's right. That's right. Yes, he was on his last um, graduate student. Yeah. Um, what I, was he like? What was Hausner like when you interacted with him? Um. You. You knew so so uh, just a very he's a real gentleman. He never he never um, pushed his own himself forward he, he just was he much more uh, um, I don't know maybe you say subtle uh, so a very astute sort of guy um, smart um, had a sense of humor I when I was a professor I'd get little 
uh, cartoons or something he'd cut out and made copies of and distributed that were funny, you know, something related to earthquakes or something, you know. Um, but um, very interesting guy to talk to because he had such a, a broad understanding, um, very deep understanding of things. You know, he published textbooks on statics and dynamics for undergraduates and um, published a lot of seminal papers. Um, yeah, it's just a, just a great human being um, and devoted his life to earthquake engineering in Caltech. He never married, you know, and he was there from a, a graduate student in the 30s till, till 90. He kept coming in, you know, then he, then he got macular degeneration. He couldn't drive, so he stopped coming in and died at 98. Um, yes. So, what was... What was Jennings working on when you connected with him? Um, he'd worked on, um, so, uh, well, maybe that was con contemporary with my work. Um, he hadn't had a lot of stu uh, PhD students at that stage. Um, he, it, there was one guy, a Greek guy, but that was um, while uh, that was a contemporary, where he was looking at rocking structures, which is something Hausner got everyone intrigued in rocking in earthquakes. Um, and you know, I'm trying to think what um, the, one of the students just before me. Um, I'm trying to think what his. Uh, he, he's now a structural engineer in Seattle, you know, he's mid seventies, but he's still active. I was trying to think what his thesis on, I cannot think at the moment what he, what he did. Um, so Paul didn't have many students and he was a guy that um, let you, gave you great freedom. You know, he did, he did steer me a bit. He said, um, well, you know, we've got all these earthquake records from structures um, in, uh, in the San Fernando earthquake in 71. And really people have been sort of dabbling and looking at them, but no one's really done it systematically and so on. So I got, I started getting into that and, you know, found this all this whole area system identification that should be used, wasn't used in earthquake engineering, just a systematic way of trying to determine models from data or, or improve or update models. Of course, didn't have the Bayesian updating in those days. So anyway, I got into that. I looked at some fundamental issues in theory, uh, identifiability. If you've got just a few records, which we, we you know, these are expensive instruments. I mean, over a thousand dollars. So they were only, there's only a few in each structure. In fact, you had to put one in the basement under the bylaw and one on the roof. And if it was beyond a six stories, I think you had to put one in mid height. And they, these had, they were triaxial, so they did two horizontal components and a vertical. So we didn't have much data uh, at all. And um, so you had to take that, uh, the issue of uh, identifiability. What, what can you uniquely determine about a model? Suppose you postulate some sort of mathematical form for the model. How, how much can you learn about that model? Can you estimate the parameters of the unique estimates, for example, you know, if you've got some sort of optimality criterion. Um, so that was theoretical work. And then I worked on what algorithms can we use that will work better than, uh, you know, what this sort of trial and error and playing around with had done so far with this data. And uh, I had one that was really beautiful mathematically, then it didn't work very well when I went to real data. It worked great with simulated data where you know the answers and you generate um, uh, you know, response as if it was an earthquake response. You take an earthquake input, add some noise. It worked well, but when it came to real data, it didn't. So then I worked on another method um, that wasn't so mathematically elegant, but more straightforward, and it worked very well. And that's what I I um, pushed further in my thesis. And now, Jim, when you talk about working with real data, what does that look like? What's the what's the experiment? So when these instruments uh, trigger, they are uh, measuring accelerations, right? They can't be measuring displacements attached to the building and displacement relative to what? To the ground? There's no way it has a reference. So it's actually an inertial system. So it's a measuring acceleration. So 
uh, to get uh, displacements uh, of the, of the at the points in the building, you would have to so-called double integrate the time history's acceleration. First, get velocity with one integration, then another with um, integration to get displacement. And the problem with that is noise, low frequency noise, completely messes things up. So your displacements don't look good. That's a whole other story. Um, but they are time histories. So there are acceleration time histories. Uh, you, you've missed the very beginning because it has to be triggered. So it's got to be shaking about 1% of gravitational acceleration, G. And in, um, in the San Fernando earthquake, some of the buildings recorded up to 50% G, I mean, half a G. So if you had been standing in those buildings, you'd be have half your body weight horizontally sort of slamming you about, you know, you'd certainly have to be holding on to something. Um, so, yes, so just time histories of accelerations, that's the raw data. And they've been processed because they were on films, so they had to digitize it, 70 millimeter film. And um, uh, so Caltech had developed a whole digitizer system to, to do that. They actually did that for the community at that stage because there was no state program until I think the late seventies that that was um, uh, looking at, you know, recording the motions and digitizing them and so on. When did you know you had enough to defend? What was the, the sense of completion you had with your thesis? Well, I felt I had a good dose of the theory, this identifiability, non-uniqueness, it was sort of mathematical and gave, gave some you know good results good practical results that you shouldn't try to uh, identify the so-called stiffness and damping matrices of a linear structural model you should go and just identify the modal parameters that's much less um, information but that's all you can determine reliability reliably so that's the theory and then i had these two methods the elegant mathematical one uh, Richard Bellman, a famous guy at USC, had come up with it called Inverity, Invariant Embedding Filter. But that didn't work so well in practice with the, because of modeling errors and, you know, in the, in real, in the, with the real data. Um, uh, and so then I dealt out this other thing, which I called modal, modal minimization, later mode ID, identify the modal properties. Um, and so I had, and then I applied it to two sets of building records the, to demonstrate how it works and what you can gain from it. So there was the 42 story Union Bank building in downtown LA, which sits, you know, next to the freeway down there. And um, the nine story, both these were steel frame buildings and the nine story building 180 at JPL, which had been instrumented. And so, so I had the theory, then I had the algorithms, the methods for getting out these things I'd prove, these parameters that I proved were what the data should give uniquely. And then I applied these methods to these uh, real earthquake records from two, two steel frame buildings. And that sort of seemed like, okay, that's, it. that's, that's good. I've got the theory, I've got the data, I've got some results from the data. That seemed to be enough. Uh, and I'm sure I talked to Paul Jennings and he said that that's enough. <laughs> Jim, how far out into the real world did you see this research? Did you see um, obvious applications or was that not yet on your radar? Oh, no, um, no, I was aware right from the start um, that this would be useful information for a start. Um, in those days, when they were designing, they were using, uh, for designing against earthquakes, they were using dynamic modeling, but they were linear models. And so the question was, how good is that when, you know, when you've got strong shaking and possibly damaging and we know steel yields and all that, you know, um, when do these linear models break down? So there was this assessing linear structural models, but on top of that, these linear models have, you know, you have damping in the system and damping in structures is a very complicated thing. It's hysteretic, it's deteriorating, damping and so on. Uh, but linearly, we use what's a viscous damping model, which it really isn't. But how adequate was that? You know, we have equivalent viscous damping. And 
what are the appropriate values to use in design because you can't do any theory it's the wrong theory it's viscous damping we know that so it's not like you can have a theoretical model and predict what the damping should be so that was purely empirical and initially people just took a guess basically you know and uh, or you know it was yeah there was a standards and acceptance of what the damping should be but no real um data for it at earthquake levels so i was able to you know get that damping out um for the modes what it should be the equivalent viscous damping um, so assessing the models and finding these parameters particularly the damping uh, parameters and or even the natural frequencies because you have a theoretical model a finite owl model you predict what the frequencies would be and they turned out to be wrong you know they were never what what you, i actually got out of my record out of the uh, strong motion records um, but in most cases, they were perhaps within about 10% or something of the actual observed frequencies. Um, so, yes, the industry was interested in that. Uh, and I remember I got involved with my program to look at um, offshore platform off the coast of uh, uh, Santa Barbara. It was a Chevron platform, and they were very interested in what is the damping in the, in the structure uh at earthquake levels and they'd got um strong motion records during the uh was it the 71 i think it was the 71 earthquake so um i was able to analyze the offshore platform data and with my technique and get out the damping ratios um and uh, they, that even harder had a huge boat which they tied a you know gigantic cable to the platform in the boat it's like a tugboat and they pulled it then released the cable and the thing you know oscillated uh to try to get the damping out but of course once there was earthquake records there that was much more relevant so uh, yeah. jim besides jennings who else was on your thesis committee uh bill iwan professor wolfred iwan who, who just passed away a couple of years ago um uh Professor Hiro Kanamori, you know, I had a seismologist. I'd taken um, seismology class from him. It was a wonderful class in the first year. I mean, it was an introduction to seismology, basically. It covered a very broad um, area of seismology. So I had him on the committee. And uh, I had uh, Professor Tom Corgi, who was very eminent. Uh, he was in applied mechanics and mechanical engineering, Caltech. Um, he was uh, very interested in um, nonlinear dynamics and stochastic dynamics. And he and I would often have chats. Uh, that was the nice thing about Caltech. We, we had a coffee room and I'd go in for coffee and maybe uh, Tom would be there on his own. He would say, how's your thesis research going? You know, sit down, tell, talk to me about it kind of thing. And I would. And uh, he, was, he was great. He was a great um, to talk to. So, and then of course I went back on the faculty and he was a colleague and uh, I enjoyed interacting with him then. Um, so he was, he was the, the, uh, the remaining one. So uh, I think there, there were five. Yeah, I guess Hausner was on a two. Jennings, I one, yeah, Kanamori, Hausner and, and uh, uh, Corgi, I think, yeah. Jim, to go back to that question about your assumptions and ambitious arriving at Caltech, thinking you'd go back to New Zealand, was that yes. the game plan? Did you want to go back? Did you promise your family that you were going to go back after you defended? I did, and not only that, I had a contract <laughs> because one of the things about this Nas National uh, Resource Council, Research Council, um, fellowship was that you were con had a contractual obligation every year they paid you, you the fellowship you had to come back and work for the New Zealand government anywhere in the New Zealand government doing research so um, so what happened is when I went back I'd been almost four years doing my PhD at Caltech so I had a basically four years I had to work in New Zealand because I had no worries about that no concerns about that but by the time I had done with all four years and went back i as i've told you i got restless i kind of missed the action caltech was where everyone used to come some of the most 
well-known people in earthquake engineering coming through and giving talks. So I managed to uh, last three years there, and then I and then this offer came up and all that. So I went to um, the management at the lab and, and negotiated that I would pay back the one quarter, the one year out of the four that I hadn't done, right? I'd pay back a quarter of what they paid me and we set up a payment schedule and so on. And then off I went and I started paying back the New Zealand government. But fortunately for me, the New Zealand dollar started going down and down and down. So I was paying in, I'd set it up in US dollars and it was getting more and more New Zealand dollars and I paid it off in like three years instead of five years or something, you know. So, so yes, I originally everything was go back, settle down, work with the government. And then when I didn't, I had to get my way out of and extract myself from the situation. I was in, I couldn't wait. I didn't want to wait another year, the fourth year, you know. Why, why extract yourself? Was it just not intellectually compelling to you? Um, mm, no, I can't say that because I was with some really good people and we did some really interesting stuff before I went to the, the U.S. Very novel um, engineering, earthquake engineering designs. Um, but Caltech, well, it wasn't even Caltech, really, because I was just looking to go back to the U.S. I kind of just got hooked on California, you know. I just like the lifestyle, the weather. You know, it rains a lot in New Zealand. Um and the fact that you were right where most of the action was. I mean, New Zealand's isolated. It's way down there in the Pacific. As I said before, no internet, no 18 hour flights, you know, to get to LA. It was just isolated. And um, I felt it, you know, even though there was a good community in New Zealand. Um, yeah, it was just the way I felt as a young man. And I, I kind of felt that New Zealand somehow was too small for me now, you know. I wanted to get back in the big, with the big apple kind of, you know. So, now on what terms did you leave Caltech? Was there any discussion about, you know, if you want to come back, maybe there'll be a faculty position for you? Did you stay in touch with Caltech when you went back home? I did. Um, Paul Jennings, when I left, said, you know, it's not out of the question. You could end up coming back here. There's no promise because they didn't have any faculty position opened or anything. But um, it was clear that, you know, the people in the earthquake engineering program would like to have me come back if there was an opportunity, if they were able to create a faculty position, um, which they did some years later. I mean, they had to put up a case, for, you know, for the earthquake engineering program and, um, you know, so that's what they did. And uh, I don't know now how many others they interviewed for it. Um, but anyway, I got the offer. Uh, so yes, I, but when I was looking to come back, I wasn't counting on Caltech. I mean, that was a possibility, but I wasn't counting on it. I just was looking at what other opportunities uh, I could have um, coming back there in academia. You know. Now, did did they open up a position? Was this a new position that that expanded the program, or what were the circumstances of you applying? Well, they had lost an assistant professor who, had, who didn't get tenure. So there really was, um, you know, they'd lost, there really was a reduction in the, in the uh, number of professors. So they, you know, but at Caltech, you don't automatically get, if someone retires or goes somewhere or doesn't get tenure, you don't automatically get a position to, uh, you know, open up. No, you have to make the case from scratch again, you know. Um, but it certainly was not up to, you know, there was one less, uh, uh, not only was there one less, uh, young faculty, um, the, you know, George Hausner retired, I think 79 or 80 or something. I, I went in 70, left in 78. I, I, I he was, uh, the, I took the last class from him that he taught. Um, so he was stepping down as active faculty, becoming a professor emeritus still very active, you know, in other many respects, but not teaching or research group. So they, they you know, they needed, they needed to, to boost the, the ranks a bit. Um, 
there was a big gap, you know, between me and Paul Jennings. Well, when I look back, it wasn't that big, but I think he's 11 or 12 years older or something. So there was no one in the intermediate range. In fact, across mechanical, that was so too, you know, there's a lot of older faculty and they just hadn't got the, kept the young ones coming in or if any come in, they didn't keep them. So yes, in fact, after I was appointed, they had a, postdoc from Berkeley, John Hall, and they were impressed with him. So not long after I um, became a professor there, uh, they, I think 83, they opened up a, a new position and John got it. So John Hall was a colleague of mine. I arrived in 81. He, he, he was already there as a postdoc and became faculty in 83. Yeah. Now, when you were back in New Zealand for the government, were you engaged at all academically? Were you publishing? Were you staying current in the literature? Uh, yes, I was, but um, not very active because I, you know, I worked on getting a paper out of my thesis. Um, but there was pressures in the group. You know, we we ran the, the engineering seismology, ran the national strong motion network. And so I was like to be the guy, chief guy for the analysis of the data we were getting. So we, you know, I got involved in software and digitizing and so on. There's a couple of technical reports or something in my CV. Um, so I didn't really get into some meaty research. I don't think, um, after I uh, I went back, um, and that led to papers. I was involved in various uh, various activities, but never um, they didn't lead to papers while I was there. You know, so I had a, some couple of good papers from there. You know, actually four before I left for graduate school. But when I got back, so you know, I didn't um, I didn't really. Uh, get going there um what you know i'm trying to think now what we what we were working on we were work, my, my boss was very interested in these dampers lead rubber dampers we were doing tests and those and so on but never uh, no 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 technical publications on that jim having been at caltech and just in the united states generally how modern were the new zealand facilities were you working with good instrumentation Yes, um, it turned out that my boss in the engineering seismology section, Ivan Skinner, was very creative. Uh, he um, he actually was electrical engineer by training. He had a bachelor's in electrical engineering, never did a PhD because he went off to the Second World War at the end of it. Um, but he had designed uh, strong motion accelerographs independently of the American one in Pasadena and there was a company that was making them and they were being installed in the strong motion network in, in, um, in New Zealand. Um, so, uh, we were, our group was very innovative and we were on the leading edge, this whole thing of base isolation, which you may have heard of, which is big internationally and there's buildings in the United States and so on. Uh, we were the first, this is Ivan had the idea of putting the buildings on lead rubber bearings, sandwich of rubber and lead that are used in um, at that time for thermal expansion and contraction on bridges. And it was to make a building, you know, low rise buildings and up to say six, maybe 10 stories, put them on this flexible base so that it kind of shifts their spectrum down to low frequencies where typically there's less energy. But they're not for really huge earthquakes. So we had, the, I think, the first base isolated building in New Zealand. It was built in 1976 while I was over at Caltech, built next to the Wellington Fault, which goes through the center of Wellington, um, headquarters of the Ministry of Works and Development of the New Zealand government. Um, and th that was due to to Ivan Skinner and our paper showing the viability of it, which was published in 
1975, I think, in the International Journal of Earthquake Engineering Structure Dynamics. So we were on the leading edge, I felt, you know. Um, as a matter of fact, when I came to graduate school, I should mention that I was thinking of a continue in this, this exciting era of base isolation. It seemed like it should take off and all that. There was nothing going on in the States there. Oh, no, there was a professor at Berkeley who'd spent a sabbatical with us and gone back all fired up about it. At Berkeley, he was doing, he had a shake table which he could access to test things. Um, but uh, I remember talking to Hausner and he said, well, you know, that sounds too kind of specialized and they sort of discouraged me. I don't know, uh, I don't, I don't, don't think he bought into the idea. Maybe Jennings didn't either, either. but it took off in the US. I mean, it's, it's um, uh, this guy, Jim Kelly, a Scotsman at Berkeley was kind of, I think, considered Mr. Base Isolation in the United States. And many people don't know, he came and spent a sabbatical in 70, before I went to graduate school um, uh, with Ivan Skinner and, and went back to with, you know, he was, he was actually not an earthquake engineer himself. He was in uh, material science, I think, you know. So. Jim, to go back to a question from when you were in graduate school, thinking about real world applications, what aspects of your thesis research were relevant back in government service in New Zealand? And what was just simply new science, a different ballgame for you? Uh, for my thesis, well, you know, I've mentioned um, the, the, uh, um, the fact that I got damping ratios and looked at linear models and so on. This all was helpful in the code. My seismic design code. In fact, it's issued by what was called then Standards Association of New Zealand. And Ivan was on this committee, I'm not sure if he was chair of this, this you know, like seismic design committee. And the, these were like um, uh, national guidelines, you know, about or, or requirements in many cases when you design structures for wind and for earthquakes. Um, so some of my stuff was sort of relevant in a general way, you know, as I said, design offices in those days and even today use linear models and how good are they for earthquake response um, and in what sort of damping levels should we be using and um, these sort of issues. So I had in a general way, although I cannot point to the fact that this influenced the particular code thing, you know, seismic design code provision. Uh, so, yeah, so they would do, the lab did fundamental research, but also, but always directed, because it's New Zealand's taxpayers' money, always directed towards a goal of something practical. You know, you had to justify it, you know, like, like my conviction in a box of porous material, a uh, paper that's been cited like 333 times. Is that your most it's, cited paper? No, my... I have one that was cited over 2000, it has been cited over 2000 times, and that's to do with calculating uh, reliability for um, failure probabilities for dynamic systems under under any excitation. It's very general, but you know, we, we were motivated by earthquake excitation. That was a completely new idea. Um, remember we talked about Monte Carlo simulation. It, it uses a more sophisticated version, which goes by the name uh, acronym MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo Simulation. And it used some tricks which were very novel and which the community who calculated reliability and was interested in that kind of latched onto. And it spread. It spread out from earthquake engineering into uh, people use it in financial stuff. Uh, chemical kinetic stuff and all that. So uh, whenever you're interested in a system and you're worried about it failing and you don't have its certainty, which you never do, you know, you've got this uncertainty. This is this this is a tool for, it's kind of efficient, you know, for calculating, much more efficient than Monte Carlo, plain old Monte Carlo, yeah. How much so interface did you have with academia in New Zealand when you were there after graduate school? Um, uh, very little in the way of, um, uh, c collaboration and research, but I used to visit, um, 
a couple of my former professors that um, uh, were, you know, working um, close to me. One wrote a, a book on um, uh, flow and porous media um, and had my had to figure from my paper and all that. Um, and uh, I used to enjoy talking to him, Professor Neil. Um, so I would call in, you know, because my parents lived in Auckland. I would often call in to have a talk to these guys that were former professors of mine. Um, not often, but occasionally. And um, but I so I, I kept that contact, but I never had any collaboration with anybody in the New Zealand universities. Yeah, we kind of like were working. Uh, it's interesting looking back. Our, I don't think our, you know, our engineering seismology group was pretty advanced, but we didn't, we didn't. Um, uh, the people in the universities would be looking to Ivan in some respects. I think you know, uh, in terms of uh, being a leader in earthquake engineering in New Zealand. So it was, it was more coming out of that DSIR than out of the academia, out of the universities. Yeah, I think I'm fair to say, it's fair to say that. Jim, on the personal side, your family being back in New Zealand, was that a tough sell when the opportunity to return to Caltech came up? Uh, yes, but my parents were very supportive. I mean, they always, they always were, and they realized this is just a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, it was sad, and, you know, they tried to come over um, as often as they could, uh, eventually, um, no, they came up until up till 1998, they were coming over. So my dad was 79 on the last trip. He came for my daughter's wedding. They came. Um, but yes, well, we, and in the, the, you know, the early days, phone calls were incredibly expensive, right. like $5 a minute or something right. to call New Zealand. <laughs> and, you know, so we were writing letters, you know, back and forth and, I still have some of the letters from uh, my dad really wrote. It was mainly my mother, but sometimes my dad would add a sentence or two at the end, you know. Um, so, how, how old were your kids when, when you moved back? Um, they were, uh, I think, 12, 9, and 3. Uh-huh. Yeah. The third one was kind of a, a bit of a afterthought so he was six years younger than his brother uh -huh. you know? yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't have remembered the uh the transition no no he's a real american he was born here he's born just a couple of months before i uh, we went back wow. Yeah, wow yeah so he's american so yeah um but he has both joint he has a new zealand and u.s citizenship yeah Jim, last question for today. I think it's a great narrative point to pick up for next time when you join the faculty. At this point, joining the faculty at Caltech, it's a great honor. What do you see as your areas of expertise where you can make the kinds of contributions to the field that one would expect of Caltech faculty? Yes, well, I came back thinking, you know, earthquake engineering is my domain and I'm going to be, be working in that area um, uh you know i'd done these couple of innovative things um not my idea but i worked on the techno aspects back in new zealand with the stepping railway viaduct the base isolation uh, base isolation was quite hot i thought i'd get involved in that um one of the realities though as a professor is you've got to get funded to get your have a research group right and unfortunately not long after I got on the faculty, there was, you know, NSF had decided to have a earthquake engineering center and they, um, it was multiple millions. And uh, this is a whole story, but uh, Caltech submitted a proposal with Berkeley, Stanford, USC, I think UC Irvine, six universities. And um, for the strong for this uh, center, we agreed it would be centered at Berkeley, but we'd all share in the research. And you know, Berkeley had this big testing facility. Buffalo, New York, SUNY Buffalo, won the the, the competition. And you know, New York earthquakes. Um, 
So there were some interesting things going on. In fact, the National Research Council later issued a book about some of the problems in research funding in the US, and one of them was this case. But anyway, what happened is we didn't get it. And uh, so it took us a while to get our act together to, you know, where we got a state program going and PGE threw in some money. And um, it was mainly the guys up at Berkeley that were working on it. Uh, so we ultimately created a center ourselves, but, and I got funding from that, but that was, that took, uh, you know, four or five years, I think, or something. So there was this DARTA funding, because up until then, NSF had been, had, had the uh, hazard mitigation program, and it would funding, you know, earthquake engineering quite well. Um, of course, I didn't, I was a new guy, so I didn't have the prestige of Hausner and Jennings, you know, um, but even we, 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 you know, Jennings was on it, I, I think the proposal, and we had the Berkeley people and all that. So, you know, I, I tried on my own too, of course, to get some funding. So I struggled a bit there, um, took a while. And uh, what about the USGS? Was that it? Was that a resource? Um, I didn't look at it as so, but I think I probably should have. Um, later, some colleagues, uh, a young guy that's no longer in the group, Indian guy, uh, got some funding through them. Um, but he he did a good thing. He went and did a postdoc there. He actually had a Cal he, he uh, got a PhD uh, Caltech in earthquake engineering, and then went and did a postdoc over in seismology. So, you know, gave him I think more credibility in the se seismo side. Um, they were interested in what he was doing. Um, what they call it, rupture to rafters, ruptures to rafters. So you you want to model everything from the earthquake shaking it at the source, you know, the rupture, the, the, the rupture, all the way through propagation to into your to your structure, and then the model the structure. So he was able to span the whole range with his computer simulations, you know. Uh, so there was funding there, but I, I don't know about my days, and I never tried it. You know, maybe I should have, you know. I kind of just did the traditional thing that we were doing at the group. So I didn't break out until later. And you can see, you can see in the eighties, my record is thin and, you know, it wasn't until in the nineties things started to get going. And, and, and then, you know, the last couple of decades before I retired where, you know, I was publishing a lot and doing a lot, but it took me a while to get going, you know, it's um it's inspirational for uh for graduate students to know that uh even for assistant professors things can be a little shaky at the beginning. That's right. Actually, you know to tell you the truth if I was go if I if I was starting now and I did that I don't think I'd get tenure. It's so much more tougher, <laughs> you know. I feel I feel for these young guys, you know, a lot of pressure on them and a lot of expectations much more than I feel in my days, you know. Jim, that's a great place to pick up for next time, particularly on the on the topic of the culture at Caltech, where the impetus is to give junior faculty the tools they need to succeed. I think that's a really important point, And let's pick up on that for next time.